Smoke fills a passenger plane 10 kilometers in the sky. We're on base. We're going down. Electrical systems fail as the smoke gets worse. We're going to need an emergency landing. Put your head on your lap. We're going to need fire trucks. They're standing by for you. What seemed like a small problem at first has become a life or death struggle for everyone on board Air Canada 797. Early evening, June 2nd, 1983. Supper time aboard Air Canada Flight 797. Captain Donald Cameron has been working for Air Canada for 17 years and has flown almost 5,000 hours on a DC-9. But it doesn't mean he gets to eat first. How's your seafood? Nice? Before he can dig in, his first officer, Claude Wimet, will have to finish. Good. <laughs> The jet is in the middle of a flight from Dallas, Texas to Toronto. The heavy cloud cover below hides some light showers. But at their cruising altitude of 11,000 meters, the view is clear and bright. The DC-9 is only half full today, with 41 passengers scattered throughout the plane. Can I have some tea, please? 24-year-old Diane Fadley is an active member of the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation. We have a number of different fundraising activities. And once a year, they have a large conference. Um, and at this time, it happened to be in Toronto. Raymond Chalafaux is 23 and recently married. He's returning home from his first ever business trip. It was a little bit frightening, both for me and for my wife. I was supposed to be gone four or five days. So uh, first time we were separated for a long period of time, so uh, it, wa it was kind of uh, insecuring for me, yeah. And a few rows further up sits a growing legend in the world of folk music. Stan Rogers is just 33, but his career is beginning to take off outside of his native Canada. I think Stan's best known songs celebrate ordinary people. The songs are really about ordinary people rising to the occasion and uh, becoming heroes on their own. Just before seven o'clock, the plane is a little more than halfway to Toronto. What is that? It's right there, I see it. Right there. Yeah. Three circuit breakers have popped out. Like fuses, they protect delicate electrical circuits on the plane from becoming overloaded. Like a machine gun. Yeah, zap, zap, zap. The three breakers are for the flushing motor in the toilet at the rear of the plane. Cameron decides to give them a few minutes before he tries to reset them again. Someone must have pushed a rag down the toilet or something. Jammed it and it overheated. Cameron thinks that something must be stopping the motor from working properly. But it's not an emergency. Toilets get blocked all the time. Flight attendants Laura Kayama and Judy Davidson are busy serving up dinner in the cabin. In the cockpit, it's Captain Cameron's turn to eat. But first he wants to reset the three circuit breakers. Without them, the toilet won't work. The rest of the flight could get uncomfortable for the passengers. Pops, as I push it. He's given it more than eight minutes, but whatever is wrong with the washroom isn't fixing itself. At the back of the plane, one of the passengers complains about a disturbing odor. Yeah, that is a strange smell. Let me take a look. Connie Kirsch is a Texan headed for a business meeting in Toronto. I had smelled a 
peculiar smell where I was sitting. And I, it, it struck me as odd. Actually, it was a wiry smell. It wasn't a smoke smell. A wisp of smoke is leaking out of the washroom. The smoke and the acrid smell of burning plastic takes Davidson by surprise. This is much more than just a clogged toilet. Other passengers are beginning to notice the smoke and the suffocating smell. <coughs> Sergio, there's a problem in the washroom. Judy says there's a fire. Okay, I'll be right there. Chief flight attendant Sergio Benetti is in charge of the flight crew. As a precaution, we're moving everyone through those. <coughs> The smoke is noxious and overpowering. Benetti can't see any flames, but he sprays the fire extinguisher all over the tiny washroom, trying to coat every surface. As soon as I saw that fire extinguisher, uh, something went through my mind. There is definitely something wrong. The guy seemed to have the thing under control, so he's going to do his job and things will be business as usual. It's two minutes past seven, just 11 minutes since the circuit breakers first popped out. Laura Kayama brings Captain Cameron the disturbing news. Excuse me, Captain. There's a fire in the washroom in the back. They just went back to go put it out. You want me to go back? Yeah, go. A fire on board an aircraft is one of the worst situations any crew can face. The plane is some 10 kilometers high. What starts as a spark can turn deadly in a few short minutes. But at the moment, Cameron doesn't know how bad the situation is. You gotta remember in 1983, there were people were allowed to smoke in the aircraft. And there had been a number of uh, incidents of this sort of in, uh, in the industry. So it, it, it really didn't alarm me that much. We met finds the situation is worse than he expected. I didn't see any flames when I opened the door before, but I sprayed it really good with the fire extinguisher. <coughs> you think it was a cigarette in the garbage? <coughs> no, not really. Okay. <coughs> Can't get back there. The smoke's too heavy. I think we'd better go down. But flight attendant Sergio Benetti has a very different assessment of the situation. You don't have to worry. I think the smoke's easing up. It's a confusing moment for Captain Cameron. Some components do fail from time to time that are not severe or serious enough to cause an emergency descent. That's a pretty serious thing. When we met in Benetti, we're at the back of the plane. The smoke seemed quite thick, but now it appears to be subsiding. Okay, it, it's starting to clear now. But I'll go back and check if that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Take these goggles. I'll leave my mask on. Go back wherever you can, but don't get yourself incapacitated. No problem. No problem. If it's just a broken toilet motor, Cameron can still make it to Toronto. But if it's more serious, he'll have to land the plane immediately before the small inconvenience becomes a deadly problem. June 2nd, 1983. Air Canada Flight 797 cruises through the early evening. But the trip has taken an unsettling turn. Wisps of smoke are gathering at the back of the DC-9. An acrid smell is spreading through the cabin. The crew was growing concerned. They've already moved passengers toward the front of the jet as far as possible from the creeping smoke. Captain Donald Cameron is waiting for an update from the back of the plane, when suddenly he's got a new problem. The master warning light is on. Electrical systems throughout the plane, including some in the cockpit, begin to fail. The airplane basically lost all its sophisticated navigation and attitude information. So I was left very suddenly with, I think, uh, three engine instruments per engine. 
and uh, four flight instruments, uh, which were very primitive. They, they were uh, uh, what you would, might have flown a World War II bomber with. Cameron calls the nearest ground control. Memphis Center, this is Air Canada 797. Air Canada 797, Indianapolis Center. Go ahead. Yeah, we've got an electrical problem here. We may be off communication shortly. Stand by. Co-pilot Claude Wimet is at the back of the plane. The washroom door handle has become hot to the touch. He doesn't even risk opening it. Faced with a potential fire on board, the crew have no choice but to land their plane as soon as possible. I don't like what's happening. I think we'd better go down. We're going to be making an emergency descent. Brief the cabin call. Yes, sir. But as soon as they make the decision, another warning light goes on. They've just lost most of their emergency power. Mayday, mayday, mayday. A small problem has snowballed into an all-out emergency. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is Louisville Control, over. Air Canada 797, we have a fire on board. We are going down. Can you possibly make Cincinnati? Roger that. Cincinnati is 46 kilometers away. They can just make it. Captain Cameron begins an initial descent to 1,500 meters. The crew has switched to emergency battery power, but many of the plane's instruments aren't functioning. It's not only instruments. Cameron finds that a critical piece of his plane isn't working properly. Without power, the stabilizer on the tail of the DC-9 is frozen, set for cruising. Cameron can only descend by taking control of part of it. But like losing power steering, without his electrical systems, he has to do it manually. It's like pushing against 20 kilograms of pressure. The airplane became very heavy. And I, I to took my total concentration to fly the airplane. An acrid, bitter smoke is creeping forward from the back of the plane and seeping in from the seams in the ceiling. It hangs like a cloud over the passengers' heads. Incredibly harsh smoke that was really irritating your throat. You had to take really, really small, small breath, uh, otherwise you would choke. I could see it rise. It was traveling uh, along those luggage racks, you know, coming forward. <laughs> the smell of burning plastic fills the air. <laughs> Dropping oxygen masks would make the situation worse. I could have deployed the oxygen mask for the passengers, but it's forbidden. Uh, you're only allowed to use the oxygen mask in the case of a massive or a massive decompression or or. or uh, loss of cabin pressure, not for fire. Pumping oxygen into a fire might actually fuel the flames. I was crying and scared. I wasn't hysterical. The gentleman sitting next to me explained to me that if I would not cry and if I could, you know, conserve my, uh, not breathe so fast, that it would conserve the oxygen would help us. And not to worry that the flight attendants, they really know how to handle these sort of situations. <coughs> In 1983, it is not standard procedure to tell passengers how to open the emergency doors. But in this case, the two flight attendants are taking no chances. As smoke begins entering the cockpit, the captain's situation is becoming critical. For the first time, we met talks to the Cincinnati airport. Approach Air Canada. 797. We're on May Day. We are going down. Air Canada 797. Cincinnati approach. Planned runway 36 ILS. And the equipment has been alerted. Do you have time to give me the nature of the emergency? We have a fire in the washroom. We're filling up with smoke right now. Gregory Karam is the approach tower controller. He's the lifeline for the struggling jet. Finally, 
Almost 13 minutes after 7, Karam catches sight of Flight 797 on his radar. Air Canada 797, you are now fully identified. This will be a no-gyro radar approach for runway 27 left. Descend now to 3,500 feet. Your position is now 1-2 miles southeast of the airport. With their electrical equipment failing, the crew needs to be guided in from the ground. Struggling to see through the dense smoke, they could easily veer off course. Karim will talk them down, watching them every step of the way. In the cabin, the smoke and heat are becoming unbearable. My thought was, well, we're gonna crash? They won't be able to identify myself because I didn't have my papers with me. So I stood up, I took my wallet in the compartment and put my jacket on so that they could identify my body. I, I knew at that point, that's when I decided or felt that I was not going to make it. Stan certainly had a sense of his own mortality and he hated to fly. But the demand for Stan was growing, so he was flying more often. And he certainly had a sense that with so much traveling, his risk is elevated. Through the growing smoke, the crew finally spot the airport. Okay, we have the airport. The tower has you in sight. You're cleared to land. It is less than half an hour since the crew first heard the circuit breakers pop. A minor annoyance has turned into a full-scale disaster. And an already unbearable situation is just about to get much worse. <laughs> From the outside, Air Canada Flight 797 seems like any other. But on the inside, 46 people are fighting for their lives. For the last several minutes, thick, toxic smoke has been filling the plane. Up front, Captain Donald Cameron can't afford to be distracted by what's going on in the cabin. He needs to concentrate on bringing down the plane as quickly as possible. You need not acknowledge further transmission from the Air Canada 797. You are cleared to land. You are four miles from the airport. Good luck. In a thick haze of smoke and soot, Flight attendants Laura Kayama and Judy Davidson feel their way along the aisle, trying to reassure the passengers. But they can't get past the 12th row. The smoke and the heat are overwhelming. I was praying the whole time. Dear God, please help us land this plane. Please get this plane safely on the ground. I've been married for less than a year, and it's already over. So I started breathing as little as I could and start thinking seriously at my wife. Fighting the reluctant controls, Captain Cameron's strength is being pushed to the limit. Squinting through the smoke, the crew of Flight 797 land hard. At 20 minutes after 7, the Air Canada plane is on the ground. It's less than 40 minutes since the first sign of any trouble on board the jet. When we touch the ground, I assume that we're safe now. Now let's get out of this airplane. But the smoke isn't letting up. Passengers are trying desperately to escape. I got up out of my seat, and I remember putting my hands up on someone's back, and it was like waiting in a line. And I knew that was one line. I didn't want to wait very long. So I turned around and went the other direction, not knowing I was actually heading towards the front of the plane. Sergio Benetti is the first one to the door. He helps gasping passengers out. <laughs> the cabin is pitch black and burning hot.
In the cockpit, the crew quickly shut the plane down. The smoke in the cabin is too thick. They'll have to find another way to escape. First officer we met uses the emergency window. It's a five meter drop to the ground. Passengers have opened three of the overwing exits. But even with the doors open, the exits are all but invisible. I saw a light and it was the door that had opened. Someone had opened the door. And I realized what it was, ran to the door and held my help. I just put my face out so I could breathe. Passengers who have found the exits slide off the wing and stumble to safety. On the ground, Laura Kayama and Judy Davidson frantically move passengers away from the deadly plane. Fire trucks surround the jet. They douse the plane's exterior and the ground beneath with foam, fearing a fuel fire or worse, an explosion. Through the cockpit window, we met can see Captain Cameron sitting in his seat looking dazed and slumped towards the wheel. First thing that got my attention was to see uh, Don's face in, in the window and uh, realize that he was not completely conscious. I couldn't get out of my seat. I'd start and I'd get my arse up in the air or like that and I'd be pushed back by the, I have no idea, it was an invisible force, but it was probably smoke and fire. Desperately trying to save the captain's life, we met tells firefighters to cover him with foam. It was this soapy, ice-cold mixture that drenched me. It works. Cameron stirs. Barely conscious, he climbs out through the cockpit window. Barely 90 seconds have passed since Flight 797 landed, when suddenly the whole interior ignites. The flames roll through the cabin like a train. Captain Donald Cameron is the last person to escape. We knew there were people in the airplane, unfortunately, at that point. That, that, was, uh, that was finished. The cabin fire breaks through the top of the fuselage. Black smoke can be seen for kilometers. Flight attendant Laura Kayama begins to count. I will remember these words forever. She told us to line up so that she could count the survivors. If there were survivors, obviously they were dead. Including the crew, there were 46 people aboard the plane, but there aren't 46 people on the runway. I really thought that if the pilot could land the plane, we would all get off. But I knew when I looked around, I didn't think we were all there. The passengers who escaped the plane have suffered from smoke inhalation and minor injuries, but most are not badly hurt. It was almost like if you got off the plane, nothing was wrong. I mean, there was maybe a sprained ankle, maybe someone had a broken arm or something. You made it and you were completely fine or you didn't make it the young man next to me that helped me with my breathing techniques didn't survive. That was a real tough blow because I know for one, I, I believe he played a big part in my survival. I guess it was around midnight. I decided to call Air Canada. I said, I'm trying to find out if a friend of mine was on this flight in Cincinnati. And she said, uh, are you a member of the family? I said, no, I'm just a close friend. And uh, she said, uh, do you know if his wife is alone? And I said, well, yes. And she said, well, she may need somebody with her. Stan Rogers, the rising musical star, 
didn't make it off the plane. Cincinnati ground. This is captain of the Air Canada flight that's on fire here. Captain Cameron radios Cincinnati ground control from an emergency vehicle near his plane. He has a sobering message. Seems there are 23 people left on board the aircraft. Is there a scheduled carrier runs into here that could maybe give aid and shelter to our stranded passengers? It's pretty cold out here. What began with a simple electrical problem has taken the lives of 23 people. What caused the deadly fire? What went so horribly wrong? The investigation will uncover the plane's troubling history. This DC-9 had another serious accident just a few years before. In June of 1983, what started with a strange smell at the back of an Air Canada DC-9 quickly turned into an all-out emergency. For 15 minutes, passengers and crew struggled to deal with thick, toxic smoke as it rolled through the plane. Flight 797 made a remarkable landing, only to burst into flames 90 seconds later. Twenty-three people didn't escape the plane. Now the burnt shell of the DC-9 sits on the runway at the Greater Cincinnati Airport. It is one of the most disturbing airplane disasters in years. Within the hour, investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board are on the scene. The first grim task of the investigators is to recover the bodies of the dead. 21 Canadians and two Americans. Many are burned beyond recognition. Almost all of the victims are found in the front half of the plane between the wings and the cockpit. Some are still strapped into their seats. Others are in the aisle. And even though all the passengers had been moved up earlier in the flight, two bodies are found near the rear, beyond the wings. Investigators take blood samples from the bodies they find deadly levels of certain chemicals that were produced as the plane burned. When we did toxicological studies, we were able to determine that there were some significant high levels of cyanide and fluoride in the blood, as well as carbon monoxide. It's not known if the fumes killed the passengers. All that's certain is that they were unable to escape before the flames tore through. When I went on board, I was just struck by the acrid smell. It was kind of eerie because there was a lot of fire damage. A lot of the fuselage was burned. You know, the interior of the fuse cabin was burned down to the tops of the seats. With the bodies removed, investigators begin digging through the wreckage to try and find the cause of the fire. Among them are members of the FBI. They were investigating to determine whether terrorism might have been a, a factor. They determined that there was no evidence of any crime being committed. It was probably uh, accidental ignition. And so they then left and NTSB took over the accident. Having discounted the possibility that the fire was deliberately set, investigators consider the next obvious cause, a cigarette. When smoking on planes was still allowed, the most common source of fires in a washroom was the trash container. Investigators examine the trash container and find that the top is burned away. 
but the trash chute and the container behind and below the sink is intact. Inside the container are remnants of paper, scorched but not burned. The fire couldn't have started here. With the most obvious potential causes discounted, investigators begin to comb through the wreckage looking for what had started the fire. Studying the history of the plane, Hill uncovers some startling facts. In the year before the accident, 76 separate maintenance issues had been written up by various flight crews. Workers had dealt with them all quickly, but still, it's an unusually high number of problems. The plane's troubled history doesn't end there. Four years earlier, the entire tail cone of the plane had blown off. The crew had to make an emergency landing. The plane was repaired and put back into service. But Hill focuses on the wires that had to be stitched together after the accident. A bad repair job could have been the cause of the fire. There were wires that ran through there that had been cut, spliced back together. Investigators study all the splices they can find that weren't destroyed in the fire. But they find no evidence of arcing or short-circuiting. It's another dead end. They turn their attention to the cockpit voice recorder and the popping circuit breakers. What was that? It's right there, I see it. Right there. Yeah. Like a machine gun. Yeah. Zap, zap, zap. The circuit breakers trip as a precaution. When they begin to overheat, the circuit breakers turn off, cutting electrical current to the toilet's flush motor. It's a safety feature so the motor will not cause a fire. Pops as I push it. Investigators need to know if the breakers were tripped by a fire that had already started, or was the motor itself the problem? The NTSB build a mock-up of the plane's washroom and force the flush motor to seize. They want to see if it could have started the fire. The seized motor reaches a temperature of 428 degrees Celsius. It's hot, but it's not enough to ignite parts of the washroom around the motor. The fire started somewhere else. In spite of countless hours of investigation and numerous tests, in the end, the NTSB cannot pinpoint the exact cause of the fire. There was simply not enough evidence. <laughs> Even if they'll never know the exact cause of the fire, investigators try to understand how it could cause so much damage. There had been heat and smoke, but no one had seen any flames until an explosion ripped through the jet. <laughs> Uh, when you have a fire that has incomplete combustion, when, when it has a lack of oxygen, they will produce combustible gases. Those gases then can collect, especially in the crown of an aircraft. The fire had burned out of sight behind the washroom walls, and the smoke, hot gases and fumes intensified and spread inside the wall space from the washroom through to the cabin walls. Those spaces acted as a sort of chimney for the gases and smoke that the fire was creating. Although the fire remained concealed behind the walls and ceiling panels, the smoke and hot gases entered the cabin through every seam, gathering in the upper space in the cabin and pressing down on the passengers. When the doors were opened during the evacuation, an unlimited supply of oxygen was suddenly available to feed the fire. The more intense the heat, the more oxygen-hungry a fire becomes. The gas is ignited with the force of an explosion. Once you have a flashover, you produce heat, 
toxic gases and you burn up all the oxygen in the cabin and it becomes non-survivable. The technical part of the investigation wraps up. But there are still a lot of questions about how the crew responded to the fire. Uh, the first officer is it's starting to clear now. And at that point, I reckon that the fire was under control. Could they have done more to prevent the tragedy on board Flight 797? In 1983, a washroom fire on an Air Canada DC-9 filled the plane's cabin with smoke. The crew struggled to land the plane, but a flash fire ripped through the jet moments after it touched down. 23 people were killed. There was a fireman powering at us. I think the quote was, she could blow at any minute. NTSB investigators are unable to pinpoint the cause of the fire. But after reviewing all the information they have, they're ready to release the report. It is published a year after the accident. It's a landmark in aircraft safety. But it immediately makes for controversial headlines. The NTSB points out that the source of the smoke was never identified either by the flight attendants or the first officer. The captain was never told, nor did he inquire as to the precise location and extent of the fire which had been reported to him. And with that in mind, what type of fire uh, did you believe that you had? The bin fire. The report and the media attention it gets are devastating to Captain Cameron and his crew. Soon after the report is released, there is an outcry among pilots in the industry. They resent its implied criticism of Flight 797's crew and the suggestion that they could have begun their descent five minutes sooner. Several months later, the Airline Pilots Association submits a petition that defends Cameron and the crew. It makes an impact. The NTSB release a revised report, including the petition by the Airline Pilots Association. In the petition, First Officer We Met writes an impassioned defense of landing the plane where and when they did. The issue wasn't only the distance to the nearest airport, but the required rate of descent. As it was, the plane barely made the descent to the Greater Cincinnati Airport. Still, the National Transportation Safety Board's revised summary doesn't pull all its punches, pointing a finger at Captain Cameron. The report reads that the time taken to evaluate the nature of the fire and to decide to initiate an emergency descent contributed to the severity of the accident. Twenty years later, the statement still stings. I, I'm glad they were all, the people that got off, got off. I'm very sorry that the people that didn't get off, didn't get off because we spent a lot of time and effort getting them there. That really bothered me. All I know is that I did the best I could. Along with the comments on the performance of the crew, the NTSB recommends a host of safety improvements. Perhaps if the flight had been full, someone would have noticed the smell of the smoke sooner. But what the washroom of Flight 797 could have used was a smoke detector. They weren't standard throughout the industry, but after Flight 797, attitudes and laws changed. Even though flight attendants did receive some training in dealing with fires aboard a plane, it didn't go far enough. But what was more obvious, the flight attendants weren't properly equipped to attack fires. Without full face masks and oxygen, they couldn't be expected to fight fire while holding their breath. 
In the years after Flight 797, attendants received better equipment and training. The cabin crew had also made split-second decisions that helped save lives. Moving passengers further up the plane and handing out wet towels minimized the effects of the toxic smoke. Their decision to tell passengers to open the emergency exits over the wings was not standard procedure, but it let some passengers escape more quickly and was eventually adopted as a routine practice. Much more than crew training changed after the flight of 797. The very design of airplanes changed too. And in the days after the disaster, a precious keepsake was returned to one of the survivors. In 1983, a hidden fire on board Air Canada Flight 797 filled the plane with smoke. 23 people died after the plane managed to land. It became obvious from the location of some of the bodies that passengers died because of precious seconds lost trying to find the exits in the pitch dark. What would have made the difference? Track lighting on the floors and along the overhead bins, bumps that identified the rows with emergency exits, features that would eventually become standard. As a direct result of 797, a number of rules were changed, including a more stringent test for seats, a uh, heat release and smoke requirement for cabin interior panels, requirement for smoke detectors in lavatories, and halon fire extinguishers in the cabin. But the changes were too late for those who died on Flight 797, like the man sitting beside Connie Kirsch. Months after the crash, his wife tracked Connie down. She said, I just understand my husband was the one that was next to you, and I just wanted to know what, how was he? What was his spirit? And I said, he was in great spirit. He's very nice. He let me sit next to him and explained to me how to breathe. That was really difficult, you know, and the guilt that I carried for a long time uh, was difficult. But I'm, I'm past the guilt, but I guess when you go back to it and you think about it like this in detail, you, you're right back there. Stan Rogers was another victim of Flight 797. He would never be able to fulfill the promise of his life and growing career. I loved his generosity and his loyalty as a friend. As an artist, he was perhaps one of the best songwriters this country's ever produced. And uh, it was really uh, an incredible pleasure and honor to be working with him. He still gets lots and lots of airplay. And so his, his legend grows. Some time after the accident, two Air Canada employees show up at Diane Fadley's door in Dallas. They brought my Bible. It's dark because it was burned and singed, but it's a paperback Bible and it, it did not completely burn up. <laughs> this is just a reminder to me that God was with me. And I believe he protected me. And, uh, you know, he he was there with me. Captain Cameron and his crew eventually received six separate awards for their heroic actions on Flight 797, including recognition from the Royal Canadian Air Force. But they're still haunted by the nightmare. You feel responsible, there's no, no question. You feel guilt, you're willing to give your license uh, you, you feel very, uh, very small until you get all the facts together and because it's a puzzle for you, you know, you're, you're, you're as much as a victim in this, you're not supposed to fly an airplane in that condition, you know, so you're 
as much as a victim as the passenger and it becomes i think it becomes all of our our problem and we're all part of a solution it's just a shame we didn't get everybody off it still bothers me